This video will explain graph convolutional neural networks. The idea of the graph convolutional network, or GCN, is to take graph data, which is G equals VE, where the V is a set of vertices and E is a set of edges, and to classify the vertices according to some node label. So as you take an input as a graph, you sequentially process it through these hidden layers, which are uh, intermediate feature representations of a neural network. And eventually you flatten these representations out into a softmax probability distribution over labels. And the image labeled B it shows a TSNE low dimensional visualization of these intermediate uh, features with respect to their node labels. So the goal of GCNs is to encode graph structure and the features of nodes into low dimensional representations and to morph and modify these representations such that they can fit these node labels. So the high level of GCNs and why it's called graph convolutional networks is this idea of a convolution. Now to understand this, we'll compare graph convolutions with image convolutions. So in image data, convolution is a very popular operation. What a convolution does is it aggregates the features of local pixels sequentially all along reducing the spatial dimension by uh, clustering the features of nearby pixels. In image data, this is really well defined because image, images always have this fixed structure, this like uh, RGB tensor. But in graph data, they have a variable amount of neighbors. So you don't know exactly how to define your kernel. Like in convolutions in image data, you define like a three by three kernel or a five by five kernel, but you can't define such an operation on graph convolutions. And that's why you need these clever mechanisms to uh, repeatedly aggregate the neighboring node features. So this label again illustrates the concept. You, you take in a graph data and then you sequentially form representations of each node in the graph, these Z1, Z2, Z3, Z4, along each of the hidden layers until you flatten it out into Y1 through Y4, which are the labels for each node. And nodes in the citation network example are labeled by the document topic. So X1 might be a paper written on generative adversarial networks. X2 could be a paper on object detection. X3 could be a paper on uh, deep learning on graphs. And the edges represent citations. So this is the key idea in the GCN, the GCN propagation rule. So what this says is HL plus one, the hidden features at the next layer are defined as being a nonlinear activation by this DAD term, which we'll discuss in the next slide times the previous layer activations times the weight matrix for this layer. So the most interesting component of this is the DAD term. So just to define the terms in this, A prime is the adjacency matrix, where an adjacency matrix is how you define the edges in a graph, plus added self loops. And the self loops are added so that each node includes, it, includes its own features at the next representations, as well as to help with numerical stability. D prime is the degree matrix of A prime. And this is used to normalize nodes with large degrees because otherwise nodes that have a lot of neighbors would have a really high magnitude in their features because every time it propagates forward, it's being, the features are being aggregated with, with many other uh, nodes. So then the other key idea in this paper, Graph Convolution Networks, is uh, the symmetric normalization where rather than just doing the degree, inverse degree matrix times the adjacency, they take the negative one half and put it on each side of the A. And this is to further aid with varying degree distributions. So this is a quick comment on the dimensions of H and W. So DAD, this term, is always gonna be in the dimension set N by N because adjacency matrices are stored as N by N matrices where you have N rows and N columns and then entries denoting edges or edge weight in some cases. So H prime, is the first term is always going to have to be n to match the dimension of the DAD term for matrix multiplication. But then you can control the depth of the feature map with the second term, gamma. So you can either shrink it or, uh, or expand it. And then the W prime term is in gamma to match the H prime and then by gamma prime. So you can change the output of the next layer. So, so at the end, you're going to have a feature map of gamma by gamma prime. And then the uh, activation function could be anything like ReLU, Sigmoid, 10H, or, uh, or Swish. So in these experiments, though, they use the ReLU function. So basically, it just zeroes out negative values during the forward propagation. 
So with semi-supervised classification, how do you compute the loss? So if you remember, as it processes the features, it eventually will flatten it by having an n, n being the uh, first, the second dimension of the previous layer features, but an n by one weight vector such that it flattens it out into a softmax probability distribution for each node. And then they only take the loss on the labeled nodes because in semi-supervised classification, some nodes in the network are labeled and others are not. And that's the key idea in semi-supervised learning, is that the locally connected nodes are likely to share the same label. So the data set that they use in the paper, these are the data sets that they use in the paper, but this video will focus on the citation network data set. So the citation network data set is, is each node represents a published research paper. So it could be something like semi-supervised classification with GCNs. And this might be labeled according to the topic, uh, like deep learning on graphs. And the edge represents a citation to the TensorFlow paper. And the TensorFlow paper could be, represent, could be labeled as something else, like deep learning frameworks. So the citation network data set that they experiment has seven different topics for papers, and then 20 papers per topic. So the documents, they start out with features x0 based on bag of words feature extraction. So we'll go back to the uh, GCN propagation rule to understand the initial features. So the idea here is that you have to start off with H of zero, the initial features. And this could be randomly initialized. It could come from graph embeddings such as deep walk, or you can use, in the case of documents, you can use some kind of extra set of features based on uh, natural language processing derived metric. And in this case, they do that with the bag of words representation. So another thing about GCNs is that they treat edges as undirected. And this is due to a limitation that the adjacency matrix has to be symmetric. But you can overcome this by rearranging the directed graphs into bipartite graphs with additional nodes to represent edges. So these are the experimental results of the GCN on these different data sets, outperforming all the previous techniques such as deep walk and plane to it. This plot shows an interesting characteristic of the training time of GCNs. Graph data is very difficult to fit into memory because the adjacency matrix in the GCN has to be stored. So in the case of 10 million uh, edges in the graph, the GPU runs out of memory and it can't run the GCNs. So as the plot shows, uh, GPU implementations as of this paper won't necessarily outperform a CPU implementation. This plot just shows how uh, the Karate Network's embeddings look during training of the GCN. So you can see that they get more and more separated as the GCN learns to classify the nodes. Now this is another really interesting idea where they marry GCNs with ResNets or skip connections. And this plot just shows the performance of the GCN as it was recently proposed and the GCN with added uh, skip connections between layers. So thanks for watching this video on graph convolutional neural networks. The paper link is in the description. Please subscribe. <music>